following is an introduction to using Python's conditionals, that is if statements, loops, and functions. Conditionals, like if statements, control the flow of execution in a program. The keywords that we'll use in Python are going to be an if, elif, else, and then the following symbols are used to control the, uh, the for comparison operators. This double equal sign will compare whether two things are equal to each other not a single equal sign, a double equal sign. Exclamation point equal is not equal. Then less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, and the keywords and, or, and not. As an example, we can set a variable x equals 5.5 and then do conditional uh, statements. If x is less than 3, then we put a colon, a a colon here is going to set off the if statement from the rest of the execution and is required. We're going to use a colon with if statements, with for loops, with functions, and uh, so get used to seeing that uh, operator. So if x is less than 3, then we put statements that we want to execute. Notice that we need to indent those. <clears throat> at a given indentation level. If we don't indent, it will cause an error. So if one thing, then do something. Else if, L if, something else, then do something. L if, something else. Else is the last one. So we can have if, and then a number of different conditions if the first if statement isn't true. So if, else if, else if, the final statement in the list is else. In this case, x is 5.5 and so we get x is greater than 5. <clears throat> we can uh, include parentheses to group operations together so if x is greater than 3 and x is less than 6 that quantity, if that quantity is true or x happens to be less than or equal to 1 then we execute the statements. So we can use parentheses to group, and we can use the AND statements and the OR statements. <clears throat> we can also use a condensed IF statement that would take the form of T equals something if a condition is true, otherwise it equals something else. So in this case, T will be 298.15 if X is less than 5, otherwise T will be set equal to 500. This is similar to an if statement that we've seen before that took the form if condition, then the true statement, otherwise the false statement. But here this is uh, rearranged slightly. So in this case, we can see that the temperature is 298.15. And because x is 5.5, this statement is tr false. So we will be setting t equal to 500. <clears throat> Loops in Python use the keywords for, range, break, continue, and while. We call them for loops, and they're useful for, op for doing um, operations multiple times. So an example, the simple example is for, i in range, 5, colon, do something. Here, pass is just a uh, <clears throat> statement allowing us to uh, pass through the execution, but normally we would replace this pass statement with statements that we want to execute. In this statement, i is a variable <clears throat> that will take on values in the range for each pass through the loop. So in this case, range sets up a list of <clears throat> variables that begins at zero, a list of values that begins at zero, and ends not at 5, but at 1 less than 5. So we'll get 5 elements, but those elements will be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the range operation always goes to 1 less than the end value that we specified. The first time through the loop, i will be 0. <clears throat> the second time through the loop, i will be 1. Or the third time through the loop, it will be 2, etc. The range operation, the range function, can take more than one argument. If we give it two arguments, then we can <coughs> specify the beginning value and the end value. But it's not the end value, it will be one less than the end value. So in this case, 
I will take values of 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We can use this i inside of the loop, and sometimes we'll use uh, the variable i in the calculations that are within the loop. Notice also, just like in the if statements, we also indent the contents of the for loop. Here's a statement, a range function with four um, parameters. In this case, the variable k is going to take values that start at 4 and then decrease to um, 1 less than minus 1 in the direction of the decrease. So in this case, we have the start value 4, the end value, and the increment, the step size. So here the values will be 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. So we're going from 4 towards minus 1, but we don't hit minus 1, we hit 0 where this final statement is the step size. As another example, we can go from 1 to 6 in steps of 2, and that will give us 1, 3, and 5, and those will be the values. And so sometimes it's convenient to be able to uh, go backwards through a list or forwards through a list or take different step sizes. <clears throat> we can nest loops. We do that by simply putting one for loop inside of another and normally add a different uh, variable for the for loop. So in this case we have for i in range n, for j in range m, and then we would have operations inside. <clears throat> if we want to break out of the loop early, we can put in a conditional statement. In this case, if, say, uh, our error that we're computing is less than some tolerance, then we would want to break out of the loop early. The break statement allows us to exit the loop at the point where the break is set. We can also, just like we can break out of a loop early, we can also stop the execution of the current loop and go back to the beginning. So the continue statement skips everything below and goes on to the next iteration in the loop. In this case, for i in range n, do some calculations, and we can put an if statement. In this case, if i happens to be 5, then continue. That is, skip all following comments, go back up to the top of the loop for the next uh, i in the range. <clears throat> a while can be used in place of a, a for loop. In this case we um, can do while some condition and in this case I put while true and true is a keyword. This will set up an infinite loop. Of course you don't usually want to loop forever so you'd want to put some kind of a condition that will break execution. We could also put while some statement, like while x is less than 5, or while iteration is less than some maximum iteration. While any conditional statement using the conditional operations that we've seen above. <clears throat> In this case, we have a while true that'll set up the infinite loop. We'll do some operations, and then every time through the loop, we increment some counter. So we might initialize it equals zero, and then every time through the loop, it gets incremented. And if we happen to reach some convergence criteria, like an error we're measuring is less than a tolerance that we desire, or maybe we hit some maximum allowed number of iterations, then we would want to break out of the loop. It's very important if you set up an infinite loop that you make certain that the loop won't go on forever, but that you put in some kind of uh, <clears throat> control structure that will stop the loop when something happens. In this case, I have a, an error criteria, but just in case the error isn't met, we keep track of the number of iterations and break if it goes too high. Python functions are very useful. They're used almost everywhere. We use functions for reusing blocks of code. So if we have a complicated set of operations that we want to use more than once, it's very awkward to um, type that set of commands over and over. Rather, we can group them all into a function, and then we can call the function where it's needed. It's also useful for organizing code, and many libraries that we'll import into uh, Python will require the use of functions. The main keywords here are def for defining a function and return for returning from the function. The following is an example. <clears throat> here we have def someone, someone will be the name of the function. The def keyword indicates that we're beginning the definition of the function. Then we put parentheses followed by function arguments. 
These functions are similar to what we're used to in a mathematical setting. A function is like a black box that takes input values, does some operation, and returns output values. In this case, we end, <coughs> in all cases with functions, we end with a, semi or a colon, and then we indent the contents of the function. When we stop indenting, it means that the function is finished. <clears throat> so here's a function that computes a sum of two values, and all this function does is print um, the fact that we're in fu function sum1, and then we print the value of the sum to the screen. Now, in this case, uh, functions don't require a return statement, and we didn't provide one. The function will just go until the last statement, and then it will um, stop execution of the function. We can add a return statement. Anywhere we put a return statement, the execution will stop. So in this case, we see the sum printed and then a return statement and any following uh, uh, statements won't be executed. We can also explicitly return the value of the sum. So here all we do is print that we're in the function. The function itself returns a value x plus y. So this would be similar to if we wanted to say um, we could evaluate, say, c equals sum to x comma y, and the value of the sum of x and y would be uh, saved in the, in the variable c. Here's a function where we square both. So this simply squares x and squares y and returns the square of both. In this case, we can return more than one value. Here we're returning both x squared and y squared, and we can save those in two separate variables. So here's an example of using uh, these um, four functions. Here we have sum156, and the output from it is in sum1, and then it prints. Then we can go s equals sum2, 1, 2, and that'll save the value 3 in the variable s, and then we can print what s is, and we get s equals 3 printed to the screen. For the um, square both function, we can say a comma b equals square both, 3, 4, and when we print a and b, we can see that we get 9 and 16 printed in the screen. Or we don't need to save it in a variable, we can simply print the function. And then <clears throat> the square of both variables will be printed to the screen. So in this case, 7 and 8 get printed out as 49 and 64. So this is the basic syntax for defining a function. Def statement, function name, parenthesis, function arguments, a colon, then we execute the function operating on the arguments as we need to, and then ref return a value optionally, and return optionally multiple values. Functions can have default arguments. If we uh, set up the parameters as so, suppose we have def get force, a function that gets the force, we give it two parameters, maybe m and g, and we say g equals 9.81. This gives us the option of giving both m and g or just giving m. So in this case, I can print get force with 10. If I only specify 10, then the mass will be 10, and the gravity will be assumed to be 9.81. Whereas if I specify both, then m will be 20 and g will be set as 2. And you can see what the result of the function is. Functions can be passed as arguments to other functions. This can be really useful, and it's very easy to do. So suppose we want to make a function that integrates another function. So we want to calculate the integral of f of x. Well, we have a function that performs the integral, and an argument to the function is the function that we want to integrate. So suppose we want to integrate x squared, then we would pass in as parameters the starting point of the integration, the ending point of the integration, and the function, which defines x squared. <clears throat> um, in defining functions, we can use triple quotes. At the very beginning, we would call this a doc string, and is very useful for documenting the functions. So we begin with a triple quote, and then any text that we give the function will be, uh, can be used to find out about the function using help. So as an example, if we type help, and then the name of the function, then it will output the doc string so we can see how to use that function. And that's true for most of the functions that we use. If you type help, name of the function, you'll get a description of how to do the function. 
when you write your own functions, uh, you would do that, you'd write that documentation in the uh, doc string. So triple quotes here. Now this course integration function, here we simply uh, evaluate the function using two different bins. So we're going to make two rectangles that span from x low to x high and then evaluate the integral. So in this case I find the midpoint between x low and x high. Then we find the uh, bin spacing, the rectangle width. So that would be x mid minus x low and that's also equal to x high minus x mid. Then we can find the area for the first segment, which is just the bin width times the function evaluated at the midpoint. The function we're integrating evaluated at the midpoint. So notice that we pass in any function we want, and it can be named anything we want, but as soon as we pass in that function, it's going to be called f inside the function. So here we evaluate f evaluated at the midpoint. So if f was x squared, then it would be x this quantity squared. If f were sine of x, then it would be the sine of this quantity. So we do that for segment one and segment two, and then we simply return the sum of the areas. So that's what this course two bin integration does, and we passed in the function of interest. So let's define a couple functions. Here we have x squared. We pass in x and we return the value squared. Or a linear function, we pass in x and we return some linear function of x. And then if we want to evaluate, we can, we can integrate both of these functions by <clears throat> calling course integrate f, the low value, the high value, which we set, and then the function that we want to integrate. Here, the function is x squared, and here this function is f linear, and we get the course integration of those two functions. So we're going to do lots of examples in this uh, course where uh, we'll use built-in uh, NumPy and SciPy um, uh, functions where we'll need to pass them our own function that describes the problem that we're solving. Function arguments can be specified out of order if we're explicit about the names. So suppose we have a function like myfunc a comma b uh, that simply prints the values of a and b that are passed to the function. We can call the function out of order if we specify what the variables are. So here I'm calling my func with b equals 5 and a equals 7. So it expects a to come first and then b, but because we say what b is, b is 5, it doesn't matter what order we get them. And so the function outputs a is 7 and b is 5 like we expect. This can be useful when you want to be explicit. It kind of documents what you're doing. So you don't have to guess. If I put numbers like 5, 6, 7, and 8 in, it might not be obvious that 5 goes with temperature and uh, 6 goes with pressure and 7 goes with volume. But if you say t equals 5, uh, p equals 6, v equals 7, then it kind of indicates to the user what you're, what you're giving the function. So that can be convenient too. A function needs to be defined before it is used, but be careful about the word used. For example, suppose we have a function f1 that returns the value from a different function f2. So function f1, when we pass x into f1, it returns the value of f2. But we haven't defined f2 yet. That's okay because we don't actually use this function, we don't call this function until down below. So for instance, f1 calls f2, but f2 isn't declared yet. That's okay since we don't use this function until after f2 is defined. So here we've defined f1, we've defined f2, then we use it. So when we call f1 with the value 5, both of these functions have been uh, defined and then we can get output and there's no problem.